the senior manager. I am the senior manager of the science panel for the Amazon. Uh, I am Brazilian, but I'm living here in New York, working at SDSN. Uh, and in the session today, we'll address strategies for decoupling uh, generation from the deforestation in the supply chain, with a special focus on traceability systems. And as you all know, Brazil is a lead food producer, producer and exporter. And it's also home to rich biomes, including the Amazon, that hold a remarkable biodiversity and also huge carbon stocks that needs to be conserved. And despite the efforts of companies to eliminate deforestation from the production chain, agriculture and livestock production uh, accounted for 95.7 percent of the two million hectares of forest in Brazil in 2022, according to Matt Biomas. And most of the greenhouse gas emissions from Brazil come from land use change. So when we talk about the decarbonization of the Brazilian economy, uh, that needs to involve the countryside, and there's a need for restructuring sustainable production models. Um, and without that, it would be impossible to, to achieve the nationally determined uh, contributions. And that will impose major challenges in preventing global temperatures from rising above 1.5 degrees Celsius. So continuing deforestation uh, is a problem not only for climate, but also for biodiversity and water uh, for, uh, with the reduction of rainfall in important areas for agriculture in the country. Um, and in the, in the case of the Amazon, global climate change combined with deforestation and degradation would soon push the, cement, uh, the system to irreversible tipping points. So uh, in the science part of the Amazon, which is a group composed of 200 scientists, uh, most of them from the region, um, we, we have been uh, advocating for four key messages. And the first of them is to, uh, to have an immediate moratorium on areas that are already approaching a tipping point. The second one is to have zero deforestation across the uh, deforestation and degradation across the entire basin until 2030. Uh, investments in education, uh, sorry, the, the third one is restoration uh, of terrestrial and aquatic systems. And the fourth one is investments in education, science and technology, and innovation for a new bioeconomy of standing forests and flowing rivers that uh, using high scientific knowledge and by indigenous and local knowledge. Uh, and that will also uh, only be possible with the cooperation of uh, multiple actors uh, from different sectors, including academia, the public uh, public sector, finance and private sector, indigenous and local communities, and society as a whole. Um, so uh, as you probably know, there are already some traceability efforts in the country, but so far they have been uh, scattered and there are no central standards. So it is difficult to have data related to an entire production chain, chain and uh, from origin to destination flow, to the high cost of implementation through and transparency systems. And strengthening traceability in production chain is a fundamental measure to disassociate them from legal deforestation and promote the decarbonization of the economy. Uh, all over the world, the competitiveness of agribusiness is uh, linked with concern for environmental conservation, and Brazil can play a key role uh, in this transition. So today in the session, uh, the speakers will present some alternatives, such as the combination of georeferencing from the Rural Environmental Registry, the CAR, uh, with Animal Transportation Guides, the GTA, and implementation of sustainable production clusters through low carbon systems. Uh, the main goal uh, today is to enrich the debate by identifying progress, opportunities, and challenges while providing input for public policies and private strategies. So without further ado, uh, I have the honor now to give the word to former Minister of the Environment of Brazil, Mr. Um, Isabella Teixeira. And Isabella is uh, co-chair of the International Resource Panel of UNEP, member of the high-level advisory board of UN Visa, and served as Brazil Minister of Environment from 2010 to 2016. Uh, Isabella, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Isabella. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be here today. And uh, really, because 
discuss the environment and climate change, but uh, because uh, the provocation is analyze things based on geopolitics. So this is my first point. Uh, the world is changing, and uh, and of course that this agenda becoming part of the new geopolitics in the world. But it means that uh, some countries have political political power projects, and other ones. And Brazil, it's clearly a country that, in my opinion, doesn't have a political power project. We have ambition, rich country. And uh, we need to understand the new dynamics of the world and how this uh, issue of nature and also other issues like peace and security should be part of our assets where to go into the into, into this new moment of the world where nature is becoming an asset. Uh, not only to have business or economic growth, but also to fight against social and environmental inequalities. So my first point here is that uh, we need to understand the role of supply chains and traceability, okay? Absolutely different than used to be seen when we go into the environmental bubble, use this expression, goes, of course but to make sure that we need to move beyond our silo and also to make sure that the movement is not a positive of the environment. And the environment that has much change, if you want to discuss this, consider the challenges that you have to bring nature to the core of the new geopolitical dynamics of the world. And what it means when we go to understand this, we need to understand the first perspective is how nine nations and multilateral system will be transformed. Because this means that the only international cooperation system that deals with universality. And it's very important to observe this because sometimes my feeling is that we don't have business leaders that understand very well what multilateral system means. And it's absolutely clear when you go into the Southern Development Summit that's happened this week here in Brazil, uh, here in New York, sorry. And uh, <coughs> my feeling that you don't have the full understanding of what it means. What well, the perspective is that emergence of this debate. It's the same for next year that we have the summit for the future. Okay, and uh, I'm also not sure if people prepare, are prepared to discuss the future. It's the perspective that the international community is looking for to address. So we need to understand how things that happen today at the, universe, at the international community. And this means also that the international community is not only managing moving considering the multilateral system. You know that you have different geopolitical blocks emerging or being reframed by BRICS, BRICS Plus. And now, in fact, today, uh, I knew from Indonesia that uh, the paper of Nation B, the thing that's in your time, that the Indonesia uh, was blocked. I'm not sure if it's blocked, the right word, to be part of Plus Plus. Now, he's looking forward to be part of OECD. Okay? So, you have the old blocks that's coming to be referred. And we have the new blocks that are emerging or looking for to emerge by the new perspectives of Brazil and Amazon cultivation, for example, in a new level of octa, or even you go to discuss uh, G20 into new perspectives. So what I'm trying to say is that the countries are coming to address common and share interests. And this is the new dynamics that are coming. It's very important to observe, like you have uh, African Union and the last summit in Africa was absolutely fantastic if you go into the geopolitical interests. And why this is fantastic? Because after this, thank you very much, after this, you have the announcement, we had the announcement that the African Union joined G20, invited by India, a chair of G20. So this means the new dynamics of how non West countries are coming to be closer to Africa continent and to make sure. It's not the European or the last countries. If you make sure that uh, uh, we'd like to have really 
common interest to be addressed. And part of this, of course, means natural resources, and part of this, of course, means trade and international markets. And of course, food is part of this equation because it's the security. So it's not only energy security, it's food security also. So, and also, of course, we're discussing nature security. How you can access nature? Okay? How you can understand the valuable, the value, sorry, the value of what is invisible today. And this is often today, though. Unfortunately, in Brazil, the debate still pays on the past. And this is my third point. It's very good to see the new movements of Brazil, Brazilian governments. This year, here in New York, it was impressive. It recognized this. But it's good that Brazil is back. But I'm not sure if it's the future back. And this is the question that must be addressed. Because that's why we are here to see that table is room to debate the role of, uh, of uh, agriculture to address really what we like to be, what we want to grab, what we like to, what's the role in the place that Brazil would like to play, considering the future and considering the challenges of the world. And what it means, it means that what are the solutions that could be provided now? This is my fourth point. The difference of, among different all these countries is that to have really, really minimal part of countries in the world that are able to provide solutions in short term perspective. Brazil is part of this. Not only because we have nature, but because not only because we have peace and we have security considering yeah. our frontiers, but because we have alternatives. And agriculture is part of this. It's very important to understand what should we like, what should be refrain and reshape in our agriculture, and in my opinion, not only in Brazil, this means the often people politics interest, this means how it should come South America, how it should come Latin America. Is Latin America able to transform its way to produce food in such a way that we can have a new, new perspective, for example, COP30? This is a big challenge for Brazil that we chair COP30, because we seem bring us together. It's not only food, it's everything that's associated to this, including our industry, including behavior, business model, that uh, I'm sorry, but uh, there is no way that no room to have a business, business visual business model in the next years. We need to change. So we need to use traceability, supply chains, etc., etc., to make sure that we should discuss now the new business model. So uh, my feeling is that Brazil must come, not only to be clear that we can set uh, in the past, for example, but what are the other liabilities that should be transformed and what are the other assets that should be visible and be, of course, and traceability and an accountability, make sure for international and national markets that we're doing the best, you should pay for this. Must be paid. This is very important to observe because it's easier to take decisions unilaterally without understanding the costs and without understanding the legal requirements that you need to impose new standards for international trade. And this is what traceability should also bring into the room. Because if you are able to produce, you are able to deliver, if you are able to assess the knowledge, you are able to have jobs, etc., etc., we must discuss bilaterally, trilaterally, and globally what are the standards of food production in the world. And this will merge with the robust supply chains. Uh, traceability systems and accountability. Okay, if you're able to have a cattle ranch, free, 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 free lot, lot um, cattle ranch, uh, as we have chicken, I have to, I like to buy eggs from happy chickens. <laughs> yes, yeah, true. So if I not, if I like to eat uh, beef. I would like to buy beef without chain. I would like to buy beef with really cattle ranch that I can I can know that this is really with welfare. 
this is a method to go and compare, for example, what's happening in this country when you go to capital region in the United States. Okay? And this means that the public I can go against the regular community because they like plants and I like beef. I have been more comfortable to take my decision because not being expecting on gas is a fair And this is very important to observe because this means that we will impact individual choice, we impact the new generations, we impact markets. And this is what persuaded all for me how to have a inclusive consumption based on nature values and how we can remunerate this. And this means when you go into the international community and do geopolitics of climate, we have climate geopolitics today, we understand why you can go to individual consumers or international markets using consider how to ground the agenda, consider risks, and minimize risks. It's very important when you have traceability to make sure that we do this. Also, you can make clear how part of mitigation strategy of a country like Brazil and how it can help prepare for adaptation, consider capital range. And this means also accountability and traceability. Okay? If you want to go into this new world, if you want to go to have all the elements to sit at the table and to manage this as really a country that is a solution provider. My last point here, because I don't have much time, is exactly what is happening in the next two years, and I will approach this considering short-term perspective. Okay? Brazil should play, or must play, or could play, okay? not cold play. Cold play. <laughs> it's fantastic to cold play. No? <laughs> <laughs> uh, could play and we should play and such a role nationally internationally to address the two events that are coming the chair of g20 and also the chair of cop 30 as one part okay we understand that we have different dynamics we understand that we have different perspectives which you perspective and for not ones but it's the first time that this happens simultaneously at the same time as you. And even for a card preparation, we need to two years. Okay? To be chair of COD 30, but to chair of search must means that Brazil needs to run two years of preparation process. Okay? And this means that you should do this together with COP well, to 20. Of course, the agenda. They are different, but climate is bridge connected box. And it's very important also to understand how Brazil will be used the 20 as a preparation process for COP30 or not. And uh, of course, that we have different dynamics. We have governmental or public sector providing solutions or guidelines, etc. But you have society and private sector that must have an agenda and must have a strategy to be part of these two years that Brazil will <laughs> embrace the hopes as a government and will embrace as a society. And this is very important to observe because this means that we should invoke, we should convene, we should ask people, we should propose events, we should discuss having transparency with international community what you're looking for to address and why you're doing this. And how we can have alliance and partnership as an outcome of this process, because this means that probably I will bring this in a different shape to allow Brazil to play a negative role in this digital political arrangements around the world. And this means climate ambition, political ambition. It's not only to address NDC, it's not only to come to targets and think something that will happen by 2050. And this is another role that should be very important for us as a society. A lock net zero box. Okay, because nobody knows. Tell me what it means if you can have that zero by 2050, but you have China and India by 2060 and 2070. So you have plus 20 years 
But with everything is happening, with almost half of the population of the world only committed by 2070. And nobody's discussing this, what it means today. Because we know that have industries in developed countries that give up scope three, because this is not possible to be achieved. We need to unlock things to understand what are the critical decisions that must be taken now if we go into supply chain distribution. And be prepared to know more about data, to know more about information, and to make sure, in my opinion, that we can transform food production in Latin America. Okay, this is really, in my opinion, a powerful message for private and civil society, mm -hmm. private sectors. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go into uh, the debate about traceability. Of course, the deforestation must be in the past. It's happened, but this is a really something that we need to tackle, 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 against, 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 and hope to have no setback in the future. But we need to open the new door, make sure how 50% 50 emission, 50 of emissions in Brazil, that's the economic carbon, how we like to address this in the next years. And what you can, could deliver, or should deliver, or must deliver in the next two or three years. Why I'm saying this? I mean, what's the thing? Because Brazil is a country that uh, has alternatives to the nation, and Brazil must understand what to be, what to be our ambition after the COP and after the 20. And Brazil must know what you want by 2035. And this is my last provocation. Because we have, we have from 2025, 2035, the last decade of the climate transition. If I visit it right, we will have 1.5 around 2035. Not the environment, but I see. So if it's right, and probably if it's right, we are unfortunately. Okay, we need to understand what is our mission by 2035. And for this, it's not an Amazon mission. We need to connect with you. We need to avoid this puzzle that we have today in our country, okay, consider culture and industry, and also the challenges to discuss food production. So my feeling is that Brazil should play as a broker. You should identify which issues we should be a broker, like supply chain traceability, because we can impose with a new standard okay, for the world, how we should value the things that we're able to do. Our assets like to have good production with water security, and what our liabilities that must be too soft, like the first stage on the past, or even the conditions, for example, uh, to transparency uh, on fiscal uh, issues, considering uh, capital production chain. It's a big challenge that we have. And we need to face this, okay? And uh, I think that Brazil should come, not to one as a broker, as a nation, but also as a bridge builder. And build bridge, build bridge means that's Assume what President Lula mentioned that we should have an alliance of food producers, common producers, countries that should be providers of solutions to tackle hunger, to tackle social inequalities. So, have one, one track, one branch that to go into agriculture. This is just agricultural transition, business, technologies, markets, business model, etc. And another one that means food. Just food transition. I mentioned this in Costa Rica in the meeting, uh, the finance meeting here in Berlin. Yes, we need to understand it, but this demands short term action. And probably Brazil is part of a country, set of countries that are able to arrange this and to provide action now. Okay? And so we don't need to have in this season, we need to have political will and economic alliance. A technological a technologies availability to make sure that we can have choice and go tip on this and have step by step process. Not because people like to go against, but people able to come together and believe we trust things that we're able to. So Brazil, in my opinion, and geopolitical issues, what is, is it invisible today 
first, what must be visible tomorrow. And this is for me what supply chain traceability means. It's time to disclosure, it's time to make people to believe, it's time to work hard and to deliver. We need to deliver things because there is no way to convince people to tackle climate change based on tragedy. And this is an issue that goes to the ground. We land the international agenda and this comes into the, our lives and we allow us to have choice. And don't forget it, this is absolutely critical for Brazil to have leadership. And uh, we never should out self nominate leader. The world must choose the leaders. Okay? The ambition is to be chosen and not to be self nominated. Be careful of this because we are responsible to provide with this agenda something very important for Brazil in the next two years. And of course, I hope. True, I really hope that we can influence the world in a different way. And you have the conditions to do this if you believe in this. If not, again, go back to the bubble of the problem, stay there with the psychiatrists and also judge, and I prefer to go to another world because it's better based on solution. Everyone wants this, and this means political power. It's geopolitical power who has conditions to deliver things in concrete way. Because you must do this, so please don't use supply chains only to serve or to deal with the first station. This is the kickoff. Okay, but the objective, the vision, is to have nature, to grow with nature, and to have nature preserved, and all the assets and everything that we need to improve in Brazil with transparency, make clear that we are committed. And let's do it. Why not? We have conditions to do this and be sure we can go and can move the piece in the right directions. So I think that's really a good opportunity for everyone that's here, ADEC and other ones, to understand the role of beef supply chains as a game changer. Okay? It's a game changer. If you want to reframe things and we couple things, considering the, not only the future, the future, but our responsibility today to change. Thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you, Minister. Um, as I get really on the importance of not working in silos, considering social inequality, uh, addressing hunger, also environment uh, and economy. And as I said, uh, Brazil is part of the solution, and agriculture has a uh, it's part of the the, the equation. Uh, and we to really think of traceability and accountability, and think of the road to. G20, COP30, and Brazil has a key role in the future. Um, I would like now to give the word to Dr. Kevin Carl. Kevin is a research associate at the Center of Global Energy Policy at Columbia University, specializing in the intersection of fluids, uh, systems, and climate change. He also serves as an environmental statistics consultant to the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. Uh, Dr. Carl, the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. How should I do the slides? Should I do uh, just ask somebody to move the slide? Is yeah. that okay? Okay. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm honored to be here and to speak after uh, uh, such honored uh, uh, dignitaries as as uh, former Minister Tashira. Uh, um, I am. Uh, basically have been focusing on food systems and climate change for the past decade. Uh, I'm very steeped in the statistics and the research. I want to give kind of my sober assessment of the entire picture. Uh, try not to overwhelm you with numbers, but, you know, basically tell you where I think the science is right now uh, and hopefully bring up some issues that can be incorporated into this discussion. I think uh, uh, as the, the foreign minister has said, this is a big opportunity for Brazilian leadership. Um, and, and I think, you know, this basically using this supply chain traceability to look at uh, many different issues related to food systems and climate change, in addition to deforestation, I think is very important. Uh, so next slide, please. So more than 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions come from the food system. Uh, this is something that, uh, that we've been working on for the past 
many years to, to pin down. Uh, and that's beyond just agriculture and land use change. There's a lot of emissions that come from supply chains, uh, processing, transport, cold chains, uh, and waste and waste disposal. Uh, and also going into manufacturing fertilizers, manufacturing pesticides. Uh, when you take that whole picture into account, it's more than 30% of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. And it's not a surprise, right? Food is one of the main activities that humans do. Uh, so it, it, it should come as not as a surprise that, um, I mean, at least for me, I think about food more than 30% of my life. So, you know, 30% makes sense. Um, I think the the kind of key the kind of key way to phrase this number also is there's research that indicates that if all non food emissions went to zero today, just based on food system emissions, we would not be achieving 1.5 degree targets uh, and likely not two degree targets. So if all other fossil fuels, if, you know, outside of the food system went to zero and it was just food system emissions, we still wouldn't achieve our international targets that we need. So. We have to focus on the food system. We can't, uh, it's not an afterthought. It's a big piece of the, the puzzle. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a uh, total livestock emissions, um, just to give people a sense of, uh, you know, the in importance. Uh, and this isn't just beef, this is all livestock, uh, but really the issue is not in, in carbon dioxide, but it's in, it's in methane emissions uh, and in nitrous oxide emissions. Uh, so. Uh, methane emissions are important because they're a, a short-lived but potent greenhouse gas, and so they cause, uh, depending on, on how you view it, uh, you know, 28 times more warming than uh, carbon dioxide on a 100-year life cycle. That's IPCC AR5 estimates. And of those methane emissions from livestock, enteric fermentation from ruminants are about 40% uh, um, so, you know, and that's kind of where I want to bring into this conversation is uh, this, this methane picture. It's, it's, it's a big challenge, uh, uh, and I think it's something that needs to be taken very seriously going forward, and I think there's more attention being paid to it by the international community. Uh, and so there's, there's, I think, potential to lead, and it, I think it needs to be included as part of this effort to uh, uh, keep track of the climate impacts of the beef supply chain. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so this breaks down all the food system emissions by component. On the left, in the yellow, you have things like crops, rice production, uh, some of the methane. In the middle, the green, there's land use change. So deforestation is net forest conversion. And then on the right is, is kind of a supply chain. So fertilizers, <clears throat> uh, food processing, packaging, retail, transport. Uh, there's a lot of emissions that come from household consumption, energy use and household consumption, and a lot of emissions that come from uh, waste disposal and landfills. So uh, that's a big part of the picture as well. Things I want to point out uh, in, in this picture are that enteric fermentation and manure from, from livestock contribute significantly to total food system emissions. Uh, and this is, I believe, uh, 2019 numbers. So might be a little different this year, but just the, the methane emissions from enteric fermentation from globally were almost equivalent to all emissions from deforestation in 2019. So that's why this, this methane uh, issue is, is very important to look at. Next slide, please. This is maybe a little complicated. I try as a scientist to not have slides like this, but then I keep doing it for some reason and find myself having to explain it. Um, but so the, the, what this is showing is that four uh, emissions that happen this year. So let's just single out just the emissions that happened this year, not historical emissions. This is, the, which is important. I am not going to disregard it, but I just want to paint the picture of, of how methane works. Um, so a pulse of emissions from this year, uh, the, the CO2, that all the CO2 that is emitted this year and all the methane that is emitted this year, uh, in about 10 years, will have the same warming impact uh, on the planet. So that's the time horizon year zero. If you look at about year 10, the methane and the CO2 uh, you know, provide the same warming impact. 
methane goes down much quicker, CO2 lives in the atmosphere much longer. This is very important uh, because it's actually a potential progress if we could reduce methane significantly, that means that we could have a big impact on near-term warming, uh, whereas the historical CO2 is in the atmosphere, uh, and so that's something that is a little bit harder to, to deal with uh, in the short term. Next slide, please. Uh, so um, this is just to highlight that point uh, based off of that, uh, you know, that pulse of emissions from this year in the early 2030s. I won't run through all the math, but basically we would say about 1% of the warming we face from this year's emissions it, by, in the early 2030s, about 1% of it will be attributed to deforestation in Brazil. Next slide, please. Whereas but from the pulse of emissions from this year, about 2% will be uh, uh, caused by enteric fermentation from methane in Brazil. So the warming impact from the emissions from this year are actually in, in 10 years by early 2030s will be more from methane than from deforestation, according to 2020 deforestation rates. So that's just to, to paint the picture of why people are paying more attention to methane and why I think it's important to think about because of it's important on, on kind of the, the, the world that we live in now, the world that we will inhabit in, and, and live in in the 2030s, the, our experience will be shaped in a large part by the methane that is emitted today. Uh, and I think that's important message for, in terms of climate communication is that, you know, climate change is here, it's happening now. Uh, and also the, the impact of methane is something we will feel in our lifetimes. Uh, as as well as you know, thinking about generations ahead. Obviously, those generations are are important to think about with CO two. But but I think this is an important message because uh, not everyone understands the impacts that we're going to have on ourselves. Uh, next slide, please. Food systems have more objectives than just you know uh, re being responsible for uh, uh, a, a safe and stable climate. Uh, as I've noted, it's an important part of it, but obviously we have to think about food security. So if we take, take about all the sustainable development goals, zero hunger, we need to be working on decent work and economic growth. The livelihoods associated with livestock are crucial uh, and you know, nutrition, culture, food safety, there's a lot of different food system objectives. So I don't wanna lose part of that picture. Next slide, please. Um, you know, 40% of agricultural GDP come from livestock. Over, you know, a billion people are estimated to be supported economically by livestock. A third of the world's protein intake come from animal source foods. And much of this is demand driven, right? Global meat demand is projected to double uh, between 1990 and 2050. So this is something that is not necessarily being pushed upon the world, that there's a large demand for animal source foods and it's a key contributor to uh, uh, livelihoods and nutrition around the world, and I don't want to lose sight of that. Next slide, please. This is some work that we did uh, uh, recently looking at the nutritional uh, concentration and supply of different uh, livestock foods in countries. So in countries with high rates of anemia in women, beef provides a very important source of Protein, quality protein, so protein that's reflecting, you know, the, the digestibility of the protein, uh, but also things like iron and zinc. So the, the, the contribution of beef currently in countries with high rates of anemia in women, or next slide, please. Also in more food insecure countries, uh, beef provides currently uh, a very important source of nutrition, and so you know, as we think about the role of beef in, in global food systems, we can leave out the importance to food security, especially in food insecure countries, and especially for some of these uh, nutrients like iron and zinc. Uh, next slide. We know that climate change threatens the food system. This is a big part of the work I'm doing currently. Uh, next slide. The uh, image on the right, that is, uh, that is the Southern Hemisphere, I think, yesterday. So those are uh, max temperatures in the mid-40s Celsius. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously, 
in, in the Sahelian region in Africa, but also in, in Brazil and Amazonia. On the left um, are projections from the IPCC, uh, and this is uh, uh, relative to you know, baseline historical temperatures. What we see in all the scenarios, so the top scenario is 1.5 degrees, uh, uh, the second is 2 degrees Celsius, the last is 4 degrees Celsius. Uh, basically, you see increased heating in the Amazon and you see a decrease in precipitation. So that is uh, not a good recipe for forest health, but this is this is where we're headed. And there's a study that increasing studies coming out a number of heat stress days that cattle will be facing uh, in different climate scenarios. And, uh, you know, right, it, it's it's not looking good in, in many uh, scenarios, it looks like the number of heat stress days will be basically more than half the year uh, will be exceeding uh, stress uh, uh, levels and will negatively induce agricultural productivity for cattle. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the work that we do focuses on crop production. Uh, so in trying to get a sense of what the impacts of climate change will be on crop production, we know a big part of the supply chain writ large for the beef industry is the production of feed, so soy, uh, for example. And in most cases, it, most of the world's main uh, uh, staple crops are going to be negatively, negatively impacted by climate change. Soy is a little bit, it's still a little mixed. Um, but what we see is that there will be, even if soy production uh, remains relatively stable, uh, uh, the actual nutrient quality of soy, so the protein concentration of soy is likely to go down. And so the land use that will be needed to grow the same amount of uh, uh, you know, dense feed uh, will be increasing. So we'll need to grow more, uh, you know, more land will be devoted to soy to meet the same nutritional requirements for feed. So that's an important part of, you know, what we have to think about going ahead. Uh, okay, next slide. Sorry, just wait. Now that you have two minutes. Okay, I'm I'm wrapping up. Thank you. Um, I am, you know, basically just just wanted to bring this back up because you know we're we're now what in 2023 we have seven seven agricultural seasons to get to um, the 2030 SDGs. So you know this what I'm seeing here. This is a very important first step to be able to. Uh, develop this supply chain, supply chain traceability uh, uh, systems so that we can actively track and monitor and set targets and then monitor ourselves against those targets uh, that will hopefully be verified by external parties uh, so that we can make sure that we can try to get as close as we can to achieving as many of the sustainable development goals as possible by 2030, you know, where are we going to be in 2030 when we look back on the past seven years? Uh, just try and picture what's that stock take going to look like and have we in this room done everything we can to ensure that uh, we did our best to try to meet the goals. Um, because I think, you know, for many of us, uh, the, the world is, is counting on us to, to try to make some progress. I know it's a very challenging issue, um, but I, I just want to just want to highlight that this is a great first step in leadership and tracking things in addition to deforestation like methane, investing in research on methane, how can we reduce methane uh, is going to be an important part uh, uh, of the process, I think. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much uh, for uh, having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Professor Carl. Uh, it was really interesting to see how much the, um, the emissions from the food uh, sector are important for us to achieve the, or not, the 1.5 degree target and the origins and how reducing methane could be so important for, uh, for impacts in the short term. Um, I'd like now to give the word to uh, Mr. Fernando Sampaio. Who is the Sustainability Director of the Brazilian Beef Exporters Association. Mr. Sambayo was also Sustainability Coordinator and Executive Director of the organization and was a member of the Executive Committee and President of the Brazilian Roundtable for Sustainable Livestock. Uh, Fernando de la Forest Service. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone for, for coming here and also to keep the bar online. 
ABIC is an association of Brazilian beef packers. We represent 39 companies, and these companies are responsible for 80% of the beef slaughter in Brazil and 98% of all Brazilian beef exports. I agree with Minister Isabella when we have to think about the future, and we have, especially among these exporting companies, companies that are inserted in a global market, that the future of our sector is linked to the future of the forest, to the conservation of biodiversity, and uh, also to the mitigation of climate change. And when we look at the beef sector today in Brazil, what we see is, uh, it can be, um, uh, I, I talk about it as like a paradox, because if you look in the last 20 years, the area that the beef production in Brazil occupies is shrinking, actually, we worked in a long time on an expansion of the production because the, the cattle was moving in the territory, the, the herd was expanding. And what we see today is that a lot of old areas of pasture are being replaced by agriculture, especially soybeans, eucalyptus, uh, and other products. So the area that we occupy of pasture is shrinking, but at the same time, we see, we still see the deforestation happening in the Amazon. And the first thing you see after deforestation is pasture and cattle, because the cattle is being used to occupy the land. So we have these two situations at the same time. We have, if you look at Brazil as a whole, the, the production area shrinking. At the same time, you have deforestation and cattle occupying new areas that are being cleared. So I want you to look. Let's look differently to these two different situations. So the first situation is about this intensification process. So we have uh, uh, pastures by far the, the activity that's occupying most of the agricultural land in Brazil. So it occupies a lot of space. But today, like 76% of this pasture area is occupied by a livestock production of low technology and low efficiency and low productivity. So we can see that as a problem or as an opportunity because we can use all that space not only to increase our beef production, because if we move these farmers to a higher technology, we can produce more beef, we can supply this global demand that's growing, especially in Asia, so there's a lot of opportunity to increase beef production, just investing in more technology. And when we say uh, we are talking about intensification, most of the people think about more inputs and a bigger footprint of the activity. But in fact, we have the capacity to improve production and at the same time reduce the footprint of this production because of low carbon agriculture techniques, the good practices. So we can, using pasture restoration, for example, we have to consider the, the pasture as also uh, uh, the capacity to, to absorb carbon in the food system of livestock production. And we have space enough for all the future agriculture production of Brazil to grow over these pasture areas. So I think there's a, a general consensus when we talk about agriculture, about the potential of uh, increasing production with no deforestation, just by intensifying cattle production and make sure that agriculture will continue to grow, preferably over pasture degraded areas than over forest or natural access systems. So we know this is possible. We just have to think about the policies and incentives that we have to put in, in, in place to make sure this will happen. Talking about the, the, this cattle protection, we have to finance that transition. We have to provide technical assistance to the producers so they can uh, uh, improve their, the production that they have. So this is looking to intensification. So when, on the second hand, we have to look what's happening on the agriculture frontier, where we still have this deforestation happening, and cattle occupying public land. So that's the other issue that we have to deal. 
And just to be clear, uh, our industry, we don't need that cattle and we don't want that cattle. The business on the frontier is mainly about the land. People are not going there to produce. They're going there for the value of the land. So the Amazon region for a long time has been living with this under economy that's based on land, mining, timber, all, the, all these sorts of activities. So we have to develop a new forest economy in the Amazon. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we have to work on how our supply chain in the Amazon can get rid of this illegal deforestation. And I think it's a big mistake or, you know, it's kind of absurd to expect that the private sector will solve all the failure that comes from the public sector. The public sector, until now, they have been failing in managing the territory, especially in the Amazon. The private sector will not solve everything. We have to work together. The government has to work and the private sector has to work. So when, the, when we talk about the government, we are talking about controlling illegal deforestation, giving a destination of these public lands, protecting the protected areas of the indigenous territories, the conservation units that we have in the Amazon, that's a government job, right? And we have to make sure that this will work. And we are very happy to say that this new administration in Brazil is putting back again the plan to control deforestation in the Amazon because everything that we need to happen is there, it's on the plan in the Amazon and in the Sahara. So we do have a public policy to be supported and at this focus on controlling the deforestation. The same thing for implementing the forest codes. That's a government job, okay? So what's the private sector job? The private sector job is to control our supply chains and to support our producers. So how we do that? We have been working, especially in the Amazon, since 2009, monitoring the sourcing of care. And uh, we have, People at the Wisconsin University here in the States that have been studying, using transit data from cattle in the Amazon, have been studying this for a long time. And they have two conclusions that I'd like to bring to this table. The first one is that the fact that our companies are monitoring their supply chain, even if it's only the direct suppliers, has helped to reduce in 15% the deforestation in the Amazon. So that's, that's not me saying as up yet. That's the university studying this data. And the second information is that since 2013, the area, the influence area of these beef packers is more or less stable. It means that we are sourcing cattle from the same places. Uh, so this is important because like I said, we don't need to expand more area to produce or, or we don't need this cattle that's going to public land in the Amazon. We have to get rid of that, right? So how we see the future is that today we have an industrial infrastructure of beef packing that's implanted in the Amazon. And we have to think about the sustainable clusters around this industry. So these landscapes that can produce enough cattle for the demand that's installed there. We have, we must have sustainable production systems, meaning that systems that are reducing the footprint. And we need, we need to have the traceability in place. So the, the, the whole idea of this meeting today is to talk about this traceability piece. And we have the conviction that Brazil needs a new traceability policy for agricultural products, but especially for cattle, because the cattle supply chain is more complex. Cattle is moving from one farm to the other. We have the conviction that individual traceability is the direction that we have to go. This will take some time. This should have been started a long time ago. There was a lot of resistance because of the cost and the complexities of the supply chain. And even yesterday, the CEO of GPS was saying the same thing to the New York Times. Our Minister of Agriculture, they also have the same conviction that we should work with individual traceability because it will increase our control, not only of 
environmental guarantees, but also the food safety guarantees. But this is a medium and long-term project, right? And we need immediate responses. So they, what Leila is going to present in a minute is um, our proposal to use the information that is available already in the government systems as part of this new traceability that we need. So Brazil has an official traceability system. And this system was developed basically because of animal health reasons to control uh, uh, animal health problems, to provide food safety. So this system exists and it works. And this is what made possible for Brazil to sell beef over 158 countries all around the world. But this system was not designed for environmental control, right? <clears throat> and uh, what we are proposing today is a way to do that. So how can I use available transit information of animals to do environmental control on the supply chain? We think it's possible. We think it's a short-term solution at a low cost and a large scale, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the idea that we are taking to our government. Okay, we want to support a traceability plan for Brazil for individual traceability. We think the country should work in that direction, but we do have a limited solution to put in place. But then just to finish, uh, there are two important issues that, I, that we should think about. The one is how we should deal with the consequences of traceability and transparency. We have to pay over 10,000 producers that cannot sell cattle in the slaughterhouses because they are not compliant with the criteria that we are imposing on them. More than 10,000. Uh, so we, we do need a governance on how to deal with these issues. And of course, you have the situations of illegality of people going to public land, and that's should be dealt uh, in a different way. And they really need to be excluded, not only from the supply chain, but from the financial systems and everything else. On the other hand, and the majority of these producers, they have the option to become regular again. They can restore the force that was cleared. So we have to think about ways on how we bring them back to the supply chain. The exclusion will not work and can create a much worse environment in the Amazon just for excluding people. We have to bring them back, right? So we, have, we need a governance on, to work specifically on that. So one thing is how we deal with the consequences of bringing this transparency and traceability to the supply chain. And the other thing that uh, also answering the provocation of the Minister Isabella is how we value the protection that's coming from you know the, the, the sustainable supply chain. And just making an analogy with the food safety issue because you know, until now officially from markets to countries to Brazil, uh, food safety was the only requirement to grant you market access. Mm -hmm. And the discussion is about equivalence. I have to demonstrate that my system is equivalent or better of what you do in your country so I can be granted this market access. So we do have this, this discussion on safety. We do not have the same discussion on environmental issues. So how we demonstrate that my production is as good as yours or better than yours so I can have access to your market based on the guarantees that we are offering. And the traceability is the, the, the backbone that can uh, gather the information so we can demonstrate this. So this is an important discussion that's not happened, and uh, I believe that Brazil should leave because we have all this low carbon agriculture, we have the forest code, we have a lot of advantages that can uh, uh, make us really uh, uh, a leader on that discussion. Okay. Yes, I'm finishing. So. Uh, uh, like I said, Leila will present this idea that we came up to use this information that we have already uh, as a quick, a quick start for the for the traceability in Brazil. And I guess continue to 
dialogue with the government. We are part of the coalition task force on traceability, so we are all open to ideas and uh, how to improve the system that we have today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sampaio, for emphasizing how the future of the sector is linked to the future of forests and the opportunities to increase productivity, uh, low carbon agriculture, and the growth in already uh, degraded areas, and how the finance transition uh, is important. We can provide technical assistance to people in the countryside and and really interesting what you mentioned about already using the available information for traceability uh, in that uh, the immediate um, solution. So I would, like, uh, would like now to give the floor to Mr. Marcelo Brito, Executive uh, Secretary of the Interstate Consortium for Sustainable Development in the League of Amazon and Technical Coordinator of the Global Agro-Governmental Center at the Don Cabral Foundation. He has served as director and CEO of major companies in the agriculture sector, as well as the president of the Brazilian Agribusiness Association and co facilitator of the Brazilian Coalition on Climate, Forest, and Agriculture. And Marcelo, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning for our colleagues who are following virtually. It has been a crazy two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Very busy. First time in my life, uh, also having a public hat, I could be involved in different meetings that I usually was never present representing private sector. You're so happy now. But one thing came, came to my mind these days that uh, I was following conversations everywhere and, and checking why those conversations make sense to that specific public. So one of the meetings with a dozen of CEOs of huge food companies worldwide they were uh, talking about regenerative agriculture. And they were doing that because that makes sense to them. Makes sense to their reputation, makes sense to their business, makes sense to their profits. Uh, going to the UN, and here some of the political conversations. Everyone talking about adaptation, mitigation, climate crisis, and so on. They're doing that because it makes sense. We're here in this room talking about traceability, capital traceability, because it makes sense to the industry. Because there are reputational issues involved, there are business issues involved, there are risk, economic, and financial uh, issues involved. So it makes sense to the industry. There are 1.8 billion people living, taking the, the, the living from farming and ranching worldwide. Around 95% of them are small farmers, small ranchers, without access to education, without access to a room like this, without access to a conversation like this. Farmers and ranchers, they don't do adaptation. They don't do mitigation. They don't understand the broader concept behind it. They do whatever makes sense to them. And we have been unable to bring to them the proper sense of transformation. At the same time, we haven't been able to bring to the government, and it doesn't matter if it's the municipality level, state level, subnational level, or federal level, the proper sense of the urgency that we have in regards of, of climate change. So things are not happening. So looking specifically to Brazil, when you see that we have been struggling to implement our uh, uh, car, we have been struggling to implement any new system for land title. We are running behind any new compliance system that has been implemented 
in other countries. We wonder what would make sense to them to change this procedure. And as we don't know yet how to explain to them, how to bring them to the table, we're pushing the private sector to do something that is not on their data. I agree with Fernand. The private sector can help, and it must help. It must be part of the solution as well. But nowadays, we are putting all the blame and shame on top of the private sector, on top of the primary protection. Come on, guys. I don't know if celebrating is the right word, but this is my 20th year of multi-stakeholder dialogues worldwide. <laughs> <laughs> I have some people that some colleagues that already left the table and they write me and said, What are you doing? <laughs> <Yes. laughs> if we did not succeed in 20 years, what do you expect that it's still doing? Well, I'm still here. Back in Sabiano, so many times. I can probably last century. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 On behalf of the, the, the Amazonian state, uh, the difference in, in views from each of the governments, from each of the secretaries, are so immense that we must realize that the task we have ahead of us is much more difficult than we can ever imagine. There are a few, few questions that we, we should raise in every conversation in order to reach agreement or success in our uh, public policies. And the first question is, what is the link, the main link, that join the Amazonian states, that put the Amazonian states together? I have been asked this question from quite a lot of people, and I could not get a simple answer in the past four months. Because we need the right answer for this question in order to, to, to raise the second one, that what is that links the Amazon to Brazil and Brazil to the Amazon? I have farmers, friends, the southern part of Brazil, they are peach and apple growers, and they're sick and tired to hear about the Amazon because they're facing uh, market barriers being 3,000 kilometers away from the Amazon. They're not involved in this process yet, but they have been funded, which means that we, we, we cannot link Amazon to Brazil and Brazil to the Amazon. And finally, what Isabella always says, and how do we link Brazil throughout the Amazon to the world? So for me, this conversation comes back to what makes sense to everyone, yeah. how it makes sense to everyone, and how around the table having private sector, ranchers, farmers, small farmers, subnational governments, and federal governments, we can bring a common sense to the table. If we find this common sense, we have to go to, to go. We can set new targets again. If not, I see you next year in New York to continue the conversation that we have been doing in the past years. That's the last many years. That's right, to change. Thank you very much. Isabel, yeah, maybe that's something for him. Yep. Who's the last one? I think yeah, we have Leila now, and then we're opening to Leila. Could wait five minutes because I want to have a question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, not able to get a question because in the mind. Just one minute. I, I think that it's very important to observe what you mentioned, and the other one you also you said. But look, uh, in my opinion, we have to do we did two things. The first one is to quite find the belt. What's the link? The belt. But the problem is the belt. What is not clear is the climate financing, climate development comes together with development finance and the traditional ways to, to approach development. If you're overlapping things or not. And you go into the climate 
in the financial debate today, this is something that will be pretty tough, okay? Because we have public investment, except what happened in micro cash in the next months, as a world bank reforms with very critical investment factors. So, but for me, for the development world, we need to discuss development. And development, sustainable development, what it means, because uh, this is fragmented today, and again, how the economic sector should come together. And for this, to have this common understanding, to have common sense, we need a common understanding. Okay? And for this, we need to have a deal making process. We need deals. Okay? We need to bring people, sit at the table, and be able to have deal and believe, as you mentioned, that we have a process, step by step. It's not only Brazil, international, it's international community, with transparency. That's why traceability is so important. If you go, in traceability in the, the new perspective. And finally, and why this is also important, because this price comes together with the modest price in our countries. Okay, and the modest price means transparency, and also we can see everyone understand the dynamics of small farmers, ranchers, etc., and to have a political education to engage people, and not to have a narrative based on threat. Okay, we need to understand how this should be used, not because we're against agriculture, but because agriculture is key to have the transformation. That <laughs> it's the opposite. Okay, you need to end this process that we have villains. Villains are okay, go to the jail. No problem. Okay, but we need to understand the role and our responsibility. That's why I'd like to provoke you and you, because I provoke this guy and he agreed. Next year, because I'm really, I'm really tired uh, to have, I would say, close the dialogue. Uh, yes, but look, next year, Brazil should come to climate change. It's one day, one business day on climate and sustainability. How should, when it's fully dedicated to business, it's not to activism. Let's try to have deals, to have business here. What are the transparent, how transparent, how accountability will allow us to have business? What the new business model to discuss with international community? This is for business community and bring the small farmers because they need business also. We need to discuss how we have the engagement of business to make sure that we can be, have an alignment with this public sector. It's not, it's like you mentioned, it's like method silos. And public sector only, it's very important to have powerful Regulations are absolutely critical, but you need to understand what, how this is feasible to happen because you don't, if you have business solution model, forget. So I think that we need to have a new political rules here in Europe to bring transparency to make sure that we're able to discuss international communities based on business. And this, be sure, I think that the other side of the planet and part of this world, people are waiting for this. If Brazil is disruptive or not, Okay, to discuss this private sector, to make sure that we can move the pieces, this agreement, this convergence, make sure that we have transparency, but also make sure that what is invisible today will become visible and people will recognize the values. If not, it's an unfair process and he will probably give up. You know what, I don't know if it's invisible. Give up. I don't know if it's invisible. Uh, talking about the United States, if we visit the, the main agriculture area in this country, like Iowa, Nebraska, Illinois, Michigan, and so on. And you go there and talk with them and check what they have been doing there. You're gonna find everything in relation to, to solar energy and wind energy, wind power, uh, CCS project, uh, every kind of carbon uh, capture, restoring forest and so on. So you, you can talk days with them and they, they understand the necessity of this. Whenever you introduce the word climate in the conversation, Forget. they run away from it. Absolutely. They run away because you, you immediately become a communist and, and they don't have any yeah, it's, it's or not. It's so it's not anymore a lack of facts, which we need is a narrative that makes sense to everyone uh, without expelling hard words from the table. That's why I say it makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, let's find on top of that. <laughs> Lena, back to you, finally. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and yes, that uh, brings me to what I was going to say with this last uh, comment of the importance of finding common grounds for our discussion. 
Um, so I'd like now to give the floor to Ms. Nayla Harfok. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing the last name. Um, uh, Leila is the general manager of AgroEPEN, uh, technical coordinator of the land use model for Brazilian agriculture, and has worked on projects related to land use dynamics in agriculture with organizations such as the World Bank, FAPESP, and the Ministry of Aquarium Development. Uh, Leila, Thank you, Isabella. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to present this uh, technical note that we are developing. We are supporting ABAC uh, to develop this note in order to discuss with Ministry of Culture and other stakeholders to hopefully be feasible to implement it in the short term. So. Um, the main outcome of this note is to have instruments that are able to monitor the indirect suppliers in the beef production chain, the beef supply chain. So uh, there are lots of work on this in the last more than 10 years ago, uh, how to uh, reach all the supply chain, all the cattle uh, uh, since birth. So this is not new, what we, uh, uh, we are proposing, but I think it's time to uh, uh, put all the, the challenges, risks, and opportunities in order to present it and be part of the Brazilian traceability um, system as well. So what we have here is the main challenge for the beef supply chain, an integrated risk management management. So uh, the, the sector is exposed to several risks, sanitary, environmental risks, social risks, and other risks as market production and fiscal and so on. And we only have, uh, uh, the, the meat packers can only manage all those risks together uh, for their direct suppliers because they are the producers that has direct relationship with the meat packers. So the main challenge is to include the indirect suppliers because in Brazil, since uh, a cattle ranching and, and livestock sector is based on pasture and it stays at least 24 months uh, in pasture to until go to the meat packer. Uh, we have several cycles of productions uh, since breeding, since birth, rearing and fattening, and then goes to the meat packers. And in, in the in, and we have several intermediaries as well. And the main challenge is that we have a huge cattle herd in Brazil, more than 200 million heads head in 2022 a pasture area of around 161 million hectares and a large number of livestock farms uh, estimated in 2.5 million farms where 1.8 are family farmers. Those are official numbers for, from agriculture census in Brazil. So the main difficulty is that the meat packers does the monitoring of uh, uh, his direct supplier, but does not reach the indirect supplier. So we, we don't have for uh, 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 where the cattle pass since birth in terms of uh, uh, location. And uh, this is the main link that we need to do. So as Fernando mentioned, the short term solution is monitoring the group of animals because we do have instruments with that information. And in parallel, uh, is already being worked in the national individual traceability policy, but we see as a, a, a longer term solution because it has challenges to implement. So we do have an instrument called the GTA, which is the Animal Transit Guide. It's self-declaratory, but mandatory for all animals transit. So if one farm moves animals to another farm, 
it needs to have the GTA uh, uh, instrument issued. It's more oriented, it's the main purpose of GTA is for this sanitary traceability of four batches of animals. And we do have the main instrument for environmental monitoring, which is the car registry, the rural environmental registry. It's also self-declaratory and also mandatory for our, all rural farms. And uh, uh, all farm has uh, uh, needs to have a car. So the combination of those both instruments is where we can uh, uh, tackle, monitor, uh, uh, the cattle since birth, at least uh, where that animals could be passed when it reaches the meat packer the, the, the for slaughtering. So we assess in this technical notes possibilities to combine those instruments and how to access the data because although we, we have those instruments, uh, we don't have complete data access, or the meatpacker, the beef supply chain, does not have uh, uh, access to those instruments, especially the GTA, the, 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 the transit guide. So the first and the main uh, solution that I will expose here is to integrate directly the car into the GTA, because doing that, we will have in the, in the instrument that reaches the, the meat packers, the historical cars that those animals could be passed. And I will explain about that. There are other ways to combine those instruments and they are already uh, uh, under, uh, uh, they are already implemented at least part of them. So the meat packers voluntarily request indirect inf identification information from their suppliers. And so this is voluntary. And then they try to find the car of those uh, indirect suppliers with uh, using similarities of data uh, between those two instruments. And the third way to address this combination of car and GTA could be the direct giving direct access uh, to the GTA systems database in order to access the GTA of uh, uh, the indirect suppliers. This is there are there are uh, companies that access that the 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 gel monitoring companies that access that, but not the meat packers uh, uh, has, the meat packers do not have access on the database. So the car registry, what we are saying is that we need this number here from the car registry since with that in the car system, uh, the, the monitoring system can uh, have the polygon of each property in order to address uh, uh, the environmental monitoring. So the second one is the solution that we are proposing here, that this is a, a animal transit guide of, uh, uh, with several information and also uh, those, this instrument already has uh, the geographic coordinates. So the producer needs to inform the agricultural defense uh, body, the geographic coordinate of his farm. So the sanitary defense can uh, reach if uh, some problem, health problem was found in the cattle, for example. So the idea is when the producer goes to the agricultural defense body, it, they are state by state, uh, they also inform the property's car number. So this is one thing. And then the car number needs to be inserted in the GTA instrument. And here is an example. So the region of, uh, 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 so when a producer is issuing a GTA, in the origin will appear the car number here. 
So suppose that, oh, what happened? <laughs> oh. Are you seeing the screen? Yeah. Yes. Sorry for that. Not in presentation seeing. mode, Leila. How about now? Yes. Yes. Great. So just to explain a little bit the technicalities here, how we are trying to merge, to integrate those instruments. So if you farm one, uh, issue a DTA to another farm, we will have already uh, the origin, uh, the car registry number in the region of this issuing DTA from this farm. So it will appear here. So in the second step, so the farmer, farm two, we receive these animals, we receive the information of uh, the origin with the car of this producer here in the GTA instrument. So when uh, farm two receives the animals, uh, farm one will appear in the historical, uh, uh, G in the historical transactions of animals of uh, uh, farm two from where farm two bought animals. So how to insert that, the idea is when Farm2 issue a GTA, it will have its car here. And then we'll have the GTA from Farm1 here, for example, in this, uh, uh, in this field called observation or another field, uh, bringing the historical transactions of, not transactions, but the, the cars that historically this farm uh, 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 had transactions of animals, transit of animals. So supposing that farm two sells animals to farm three, for example, farm three will first, uh, when issued the, the GTA, will have its car here in the region, but in, has the historical the numbers of G, of cars uh, included in the GTA instrument here, and when the industry receives this, this GTA, it will have all the historical way pathway that the animals could be passed in a time period, for example. So this is the main idea including the car registry number into this instrument that are broadly used by producers mandatorily. And also the industry receives the GTA from the, uh, from, oh, it's stopping again, right? Yeah. Uh, so just to summarize here, when farm three issue a DTA to a meat packer, it will bring not only its car, but also the history of farms that this farm received animals. So that's the main idea. However, this idea has risks. First, the bit packer will receive the information only when they receive the animals at the same time. So it will be not possible to check previously the origin of the animals. And we also have an overestimation of the environmental problem since the traceability is not individual, but uh, the batches of animals. Uh, and each animal can go to different farms and can go to different slaughterhouses as well. But the history will bring all the farms that, that, that the animals can be, could be passed. Is not, uh, 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 we are not sure if the batch of animals that the meat packer received is, uh, is totally linked with those farms that we received the cars. 
The challenges, the main challenges are convincing the public authorities, as Fernando mentioned, it's a, a, a challenge because there are resistance, not only from the Minister of Agriculture due to sanitary issues, but also from uh, producers. Uh, they need to adapt the, the, the agricultural defense systems in order to incorporate the car registry in the GTA and also the compatibility of interstate systems since we have cattle going from one state to other states. The advantages of uh, this solution are that it needs to be mandatory. It's a mandatory initiative. It does not need to access all the database of the GTA, which brings uh, a large resistance from producers mainly. It give, will have scale because we will bring all the information, all the transaction information among uh, uh, farms, not the transaction itself, but the car registry. It's a pre-competitive solution because all meat packers will receive all the information they need. Uh, it's a low transaction cost, low moral hazard, because we will not require uh, um, uh, that the supplier informs about their suppliers and we reduce market power from meat packers uh, in regards to producers. And also can improve the sanitary risk management of the defense bodies because having the car we would be easier to find uh, the farm if any sanitary issue is uh, found. So here are the steps to implement the solution convincing the authorities, uh, system adaptations, and compatibility between state systems in order to catch interstate transit of animals. And we also need, uh, it's very important to have a governance structure to deal with the problems that are, were, are identified with those cars. So the, we will have uh, protocol for environmental regularization of non-compliant producer. We will have uh, shared responsibility among all the supply chains and actors in order to implement uh, those uh, regularization because the years with monitoring and excluding pro producer brought more problems uh, that need to be addressed and needs to be avoided in a solution like that. So just to finalize here, we have this challenge. The main challenge is to, to uh, integrate risk management instruments, which is very complex because of the complexity of the cattle supply chain. We have a solution using existing instruments. We have advantages using those, uh, these solutions in terms of regulatory frameworks, it's less exposed to risks, lower transaction costs, and the possibility to bring visibility to all production cycles of beef cattle and also transparency of all the cars that are uh, inserted in the beef supply chain as well. But we do have risks. Uh, we ha will have all the information overestimation, overestimating the environmental problems. And the second thing is that we need protocols to avoid the exclusion of producer non-compliance and also a regularization uh, um, uh, uh, protocol for that. And mitigate this, uh, uh, the possibility of exclusion of those producers is very important needing uh, 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 government governance uh, with all the stakeholders of the beef supply chain together on this. In in parallel, the national individual traceability policy is also needed to reduce those risks and to be effectively a uh, traceability system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leila, uh, for presenting this solution on integrating the. Uh, car to the GTA and how that would uh, enable us to use the historic transit of animals, cars. I'm going to open the floor uh, for discussions.
and comments and questions to you here uh, in person and also from Zoom. So, Oh, um, my name is Marcel Stabili. Most of you know me um, from IPAM. I left IPAM about a year ago. I'm working at another firm. I'm not going to talk about that because I'm not here um, as the employee of the firm. I'm here as a small producer in Brazil. Um, cattle producer. Not in the Amazon, in the Cerrado. And I think we have a very, um, very curious that we're having this discussion in English sitting in New York while we could be doing this in Brazil. I think that's the first point. Second point is when you go to Whole Foods, you see big signs saying that their beef is grass fed and that's a good thing. And that's what we have to offer. Brazil produces most of its beef most of the sector, grass-fed, we have finishing happening in feedlots, but that's not the majority. Um, our feedlot is different. And our feedlot is different. Yeah, that's true. So I think we should start talking about how we can make these things work and show the value of what we already do. When you produce an animal in the U.S. Um, in a feedlot for most of its life, there is no conservation associated to that. There is no protection of waters, springs, and the access of, to information, infrastructure, and finance for a no welfare. No yeah. welfare, yes. Yeah, that's true, too. Um, that, yeah, that's part of the environment, yeah. You have to have the American veterans discussing this here. Yeah. It's so, the environment. So when you go to Brazil, and I'm part of the not the family farmers, which I think the, the separation here is family farmers. I'm not as small enough to have benefits, fiscal benefits. And I'm not big enough to have enough money to have fancy consultants, consultants to help me improve my production. I have access to finance, but I don't know what the price is gonna be for the beef. So I don't know if that's a good finance or bad finance. And I think when we talk about intensification, um, I don't remember who said this, it's not about shifting our grass-fed system into a feedlot system. It's improving simply fences and water. When I started managing the family farm about 13 years ago, our stocking rate was below one. Now it's one and a half animal units. And all I've done in this time is build fences in the put available water. Every kilo of beef that we produce in every hectare includes another part of conservation. And we should be valuing that and not penalizing because of deforestation that happens in the Northeast or in the Northwest, in Northern Brazil, in the Amazon, that is not for agriculture. So I think we need to separate things here. There is a government um, issue of designating public lands, and I, I can talk on this because I was at IPAM and I wrote a lot of papers about this in the past. And once you have, you don't have public lands available anymore for cheap um, sales, and then there's corruption and other things, we're gonna be seeing people needing to invest in their own lands as an alternative to buying other lands. Still today, it might be easier to buy new lands in the Amazon than to invest in your own property. I remember speaking to a soy farmer. He had, I think, two or 3,000 hectares and four kids. And he said to me, what do I do when the kids are get, uh, old enough? Do I split my farm in five and I keep one and give the four to the kids? No, I'll sell half of the farm and buy huge farms in the Amazon for them. So we need to stop being able to have cheap land in the Amazon. There's a Command and control. I'm glad that Pepe Sedan is back. I think we should be looking at this. We should be looking at the issue of, of public lands. And should, we should be thinking of, of instruments to help us, one, finance um, production in medium farms and small farms. And we should be proud of what we're doing. And we should be showing that to the world. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Matt.
Okay, thank you very much, Marcel. Uh, and I think that uh, you provoke us uh, concerning the ground to manage things. But I'd like to provoke Leila. Uh, you just, do you have any strategy to deal with the three risks that you highlighted? Because it's good that you can mention the chain coming together with this car. I create cars, so I know a lot about cars. <laughs> <laughs> and be sure that when we design this, we discuss a lot about the risks that you highlighted. Okay. My feeling, and because we mentioned that here, yeah. what's happened to them is what we have to think of, and also you, okay, is that we need to come with the discussion, not only here, but in Brazil, but uh, share or bring strategy how we can have an effective agenda to the government, to the society. Because we need to understand what SCAR means. The car is a, a tool to deal with environmental regularization. And this means that not only who has uh, promoted the first station on the bus, it this means who has nature assets preserved. And when we compare the numbers, we have more preservation and protection than the first station in private lands. It's impressive how we like to only read the mistakes, not the assets. So we need a strategy to make sure that you can go to the national players, the states that have responsibility to deal with liberalization and make sure who are the who are the farmers or the regions of food, product, for food production that you have nature preserved because color shows this. We need to understand that you have people in, I can say you, we have a lot of preserved area, more than the, the, the amount of forest in private lands. Can I can I put a date on that? Of course. When we were at when I was at IPAM, we did studies that showed that in the legal Amazon states, if we solved if we could get CRAs to work and we could solve all of the issues, we would still have a surplus of about ten million hectares. Yes. 10 million. So it's impressive. It's impressive. The first photo of God, you have around 112 million hectares preserved on private lands in Brazil. You have our mm -hmm. national public system preserve areas around 150 million of hectares. So if you want to discuss what the areas in Brazil, you must come with private and public sector together. <coughs> so the first picture. So it's impressive how we cannot discuss, or we should discuss, how indeed we should establish who are the farmers that have assets also more beyond the limits of what we have additionality, what the legal regulatory arrangements established. And we have a lot of this industry, not only in Amazon region, but in Brazil. And that's why it's very important, because we need to connect Brazil. If you have a really robust traceability system, this must be applied to all of the agriculture numbers. Car is not only for Amazon region, okay? And GTA also. So when you go to minimize risk, and I lost the money later because you brought risks into the, table, into, the, into the screen, it's very interesting if you can identify three categories. The guys that had to be regularized, who was promote deforestation, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? The guys who has assets based on, on the legal requirements, and the guy that they have more assets, the father, not the guy, I'm sorry, from the Italian, sorry, for, uh, 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 that more assets than the legal requirements. And you should use this because you, have, you don't have state capacity to answer institutional capacity to raise the demands for regularization, so they have to focus on who needs to be regularized and believe that the technology show us that we have answered that. Okay? And go to people that must be included and have a strategy as a transition with transparency that the guy is impatient to restore and the guy has the access of financial tools, etc., to restoration. A compliance strategy, 
must be the priority to the state governments. Okay? And believe that technology with resolution of five years is showing you that the guy has assets. It's impressive how we put apart the assets and we like to be fully dedicated for the mistakes or the or not be restored. We can show, we need to show what we be restored, but we need to tell the stories based on assets. And that's why traceability, if you go, if you come with accountability and transparency, we show, as you mentioned, to the other, to, to, the, to the world, what must be paid, or value, not necessarily be paid, but value. And you can compare, as you mentioned, because when you go to international trade, you compare systems, you compare situations. Why you cannot compare? Why you cannot? Only, only we say the negative. We're dealing with the negative. And my last one, for you, as a VIP. I understand that uh, you, you mentioned with a powerful position here that we don't want to buy beef from uh, illegal areas. Must be a political statement. And this is very important, a public one. Because this is the pressure that the government needs to go to jump in the car and other instruments to make sure that we need to regularize 10,000 producers. I don't know how much in the Amazon region that you mentioned here, but we need pressure to make sure that we can have an inclusion, inclusiveness uh, uh, strategy to make sure to bring the guys that want to be regularized. It's the same when you go to fiscal debt in Brazil and you go to uh, our uh, imposing I don't know how to say it in English, okay? It's the same. When we go there, you have an agreement, the, the government accepts this, and so we are part of the solution. And this means that we need to explain this to the world and we need monitoring system to make sure that the guy is doing what's committed. If not, again, 10, 10 years that I recreate car should be established now. Okay, should be absolutely done with the critical issue that car must solve. And unfortunately, this is part of the dispute, the political dispute between agriculture and environmental guys. What is funny is that the guys that were against forest code deal, political and economic deal, from agricultural sectors, for environmental sector, exactly the guys that the last 10 years took decision to take care of car. That's why you have setbacks that have to be. So if you're not able to move the pieces now, again, you have a powerful tool, powerful tool to get which you need to open GTA and be really something very sensitive. Okay, <clears throat> let's do it. Okay. And Come on, move the piece because business, society, and government, we want to do this. But is that bell? If not, come on, this is something that, uh, again, I'm so sorry because we create a powerful tool, too, and today we have people that are not, and not able to deal with it, consider the national interests. We want to manage the setback so later, think about this. Design a strategy, okay? Give me strategy, Can discuss a strategy. Politicians love strategy, okay? It's this. Um, just one thing. Um, we have three more minutes before the closing remarks. Um, Brief. Yeah, but <laughs> uh, Well, just to be brief. I mean, the, the, the reason that our companies engaged on this deforestation control. <coughs> Because the public prosecutors is not, not because because of you know consumers' desire, it was because it become a commercial issue for the companies. That, that's the, 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 the reason, of course. And the reason why they started implementing all these things because it, it's a commercial problem. And the, the commercial problem that we have today is deforestation. That's what our customers are asking for. That's why the banks don't want to finance the beef packers. So it is really today only the deforestation. So this is a short-term solution for a short-term problem. But I agree with the minister that we have to think traceability on the positive sides, on valuing the assets. And we don't have that today. We don't have that from the markets. We don't have from the buyers, from the banks. We don't have that. So, yeah. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> and that's the discussion that Brazil should lead, right? And there's a, mas a matter of trust. I think the issue, like part of, you're talking about the car issue, but the GTA issue is the same thing. Yes, I in, agree. in terms of trust, if you have, if we design this system and you put it in the hand of the wrong institution, 
it doesn't matter if it's red, green, blue, or yellow, we're going to have a big problem. So we need to think of an institution which is just... And our risk today, it's concentrated on very specific geographies. Mm -hmm. And the people who are helping producers to become regular and compliant are our companies. The government's not doing that. The producers' organizations are not doing that. The beef packers are helping producers to become compliant. Becky, do you think we have time for one question from him? Just of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so is there anyone who would like to ask a question who is online? And then I will pass the word to Becky. Perhaps raise a hand. Yeah, yeah if, you, if you can raise a hand. Well, okay. <laughs> okay, then. So, um, First, I would like to thank Uma, Laura, and Renato for helping the organization. Now, uh, it's my pleasure to give the floor to uh, Mr. Roberto Vac, uh, co founder and member of the strategic group of the Brazilian Coalition on Climate, Forest, and Agriculture, uh, for the closing remarks. Roberto, the floor is yours. Yes. No, yeah, <laughs> I would like to emphasize the role of the Brazilian Coalition for Forest, Climate, and Agriculture in this process. Already, this, already involved in discussing. This topic uh, for years. Uh, I just got a list um, sent by Laura, uh, naming 53 different organizations in Brazil involved with that discussion. Of course, uh, the working group with TFA, ADIEC, uh, very, very crucial role on that. Uh, Proforest, TNC, WRI, Imaflora, IPAN, and the banks. Uh, that's something very interesting since the beginning, the participation of uh, the PNP, the BTG, Itaú, Rabobank, so all the banks are involved on that. And companies like, uh, uh, from the agribusiness sector, like Cargill and Carrefour, uh, also uh, deeply involved. But I will not uh, uh, name all the 53 here. But I'd like to emphasize also, and answering uh, your point, why we are here, is that this discussion, this discussion is uh, really happening in Brazil. But also we need to bring that discussion to the international arena. Uh, uh, New York Climate Week is an important event. Uh, we have a, 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 a very strong uh, uh, participation of uh, uh, embassies like uh, Norway, like Belgium, uh, UK, UK, and, uh, and this Amsterdam group. So uh, it's important also to bring that discussion international because, of course, what we want is to bring this traceability, uh, let's say, strategy and tool uh, to the world. So uh, uh, it's important to get uh, pressure from the world on the traceability that's trying to be now shaped in Brazil. But also Brazil will play a role on asking for traceability globally in different aspects, not only on deforestation. The deforestation is crucial, no doubt. We are not even discussing if, uh, uh, if illegal or illegal deforestation. We're saying we need to, we need to end deforestation. Uh, of course, we thought, yeah. Need to end deforestation. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so this, the, today we, we had the opportunity also to get uh, a general view on the importance of animal protein beyond carbon. Uh, of course, again, carbon is crucial, it's very important, but we need to go beyond carbon in the geopolitical arena, uh, in the, the, the connection of, uh, of this uh, animal, uh, of uh, this uh, food transition process with uh, the different, uh, different pillars like uh, food security, hungry, and Brazil really uh, wants to play a role, and I think it, it has a very important role on, on, on food security, but also safety, and that's so. Uh, that's why it's so interesting. Interesting the connection with GTA and sustainability, of course, deforestation, animal welfare impacts, and all that. So traceability is a very important tool to bring all these three S together: you no know? security, safety, and sustainability, and of course the social components, as we we we, we saw uh, here today. So uh, the, the, the strategy of uh, uh, dealing with traceability in, in the larger spectrum of traceability, but also in the different time frame, recognizing the importance of the individual traceability, that's crucial, we, we need to get there, but we have a low hanging fruit now, which is a combination of CTA with CAR, and that's what we are trying to propose. 
and bringing that on a, a to, to of course to the government so this is also part you know half of the Brazilian government is here this week and uh, also here the, uh, New York Climate Week is an important place to also send messages to, uh, to, to government so that's something that the coalition is doing which is advocacy so advocacy is absolutely crucial that's some, some, some something something we are trying to do here uh, so public policy crucial social inclusion absolutely crucial so finance is crucial. all these elements of finance all that and and uh, and, and the combination of uh, short term with long term uh, I, I I really uh, so would like to thank the science panel for the Amazon Isabella and everybody that is involved in such an important initiative, I think, is one of the most, uh, I, I think, powerful organizations uh, working in, in this whole context of the Amazon Basin and the challenges of the Amazon Basin. We're going to have today uh, an event uh, supporting by economies of standing forests and flowing rivers in the Amazon. Uh, I'd like to, to invite you to be at uh, 3 to 4.30 p.m. Uh, let me thank the, the, the address. You not remember the address anyway. But that's it. Thank you very much, and thank you also, Mafrik, to give us the opportunity to be here together and try to, you know, somehow continue that discussion. Which is sponsored. Thank you. How are you? Yes. Thank you. So much. Laura, I'll give the final words. Thank you. Thank you very much. The final words are sent by. Really we are not for profit and sector. Um, well, I'm here because I've been here for a few years, but it was really great to hear some of the stats. Like, for example, the one on like there is going to be 